everybody knows that the Midwest loves rope tows. And I would argue that they're one of the most efficient and effective ways to get skiers and riders up the hill. But how do they measure up against chairlifts? Well, today we're gonna to be measuring the uphill capacity of one of the most iconic rope tows in the Midwest, Highland Hills. We're here, Highland Hills, I would argue probably the most iconic rope tow in, in the Midwest and also one of the most trafficked. Now we're gonna do something that nobody has ever done and that's gonna be to try to calculate the uphill capacity of this iconic rope tow. But before we do all that, let's first get a little behind the scenes peek at what it takes to get this rope spinning at such a high speed with so many kids on it. Tell me some stats on this. What does it take this thing? How do we get it running? Well, how's it work? Gearbox and motor on both sides. So each rope runs its own gearbox, its own motor. 60 horses on our slow side, 50 horses on our fast side with the same gearbox on both. So I gotta also mention 60 horse is huge. Most Correct. chairlifts are what? Your chairlifts here. 60s and 75. Yeah. So, so basically pretty big. it's the same motor that's on like probably that chairlift over there is in this in this rope here. Um, and most quads have an uphill capacity, about 100 quads, they're 2,400 an hour. Sure. If you had to guess what the theoretical uphill capacity is, before we calculate it, of this machine, what do you think it would be? I'll give you mine first, just to kind of set a base. Okay. I know that that's 2,400. The rope has a lot of space to fit a lot of people. It moves yeah. very fast. My initial reaction is probably four times a, a quad chairlift initially so i'm gonna round up and say about ten thousand per hour what okay think? i was thinking i was thinking 100 kids on the rope at a time yeah 100 laps an hour is my guess i have no idea so that's that 10 10 000 as well so ten thousand. where are you at nick what do you think? well i have to pick ten thousand now because that's everybody <laughs> we gotta get measurements on the length of it we gotta do the speed of it and the most important, the spacing, the minimal spacing that we're gonna have to calculate. So we're gonna do those now. So the first thing we need to do is I gotta download an app because we gotta measure the speed of this rope. Now I, I've been told what the speed is. We just wanna make sure that it, it checks out with what the shop guys are telling me because you know that they can be sometimes full of it. So we're gonna download an app and I actually gotta look and see. I don't even know speed app. Yeah, GPS tracker, here we go. So I think this should do it. Simple, right here. Looks like we're gonna get miles per hour, which we can convert. Well, I'm not gonna put the guys on the, on, on the spot here, but they said 14 miles an hour, so we'll see how close they are to that. All right, here we go. Let's get some tests. Couple laps there. I did just want to make sure it was steady. Yeah. So uh, that's going to calculate into our number. Now the next thing that we're going to have to test is how far uh, your grip is uh, while you're skiing, because that's going to determine how many skiers we can get on this line at any given time. And then we're also going to have to test the length of the rope as well. So let's go ahead and get those tests done. So we found this beautiful bar, something that can't be grinded here at Highland Hills for a change. We're gonna try to figure out how much space we're gonna need practically in between each of our skiers and riders. So I think if we took the average of me, gave a little bit of space in between the front and the back, that would give us a pretty good baseline for to average out for adults and children, because we kind of want to factor in both since the rope does serve everybody. So we're gonna start up here. I'm gonna put my skis right at the tip of this bar here. We're gonna start the measuring tape here and move it back. We're getting about six feet off this bar right here, which I think is pretty good. But realistically, you're not gonna be able to line people ski to ski, tip to ski tip. So Nick, do you feel comfortable saying seven feet? I think that looks like a pretty good measurement from where you are right now. Cause seven feet would be about the end of the rule, roughly, a little bit further than that. I think that'd be a very realistic length. So next step is we gotta measure how many of that we just measured could we fit on that length. And unfortunately, uh, this tape rule is not gonna be big enough, so we're gonna have to use something just a little bit bigger. Okay. 
What we're gonna do is we're gonna use two methods. We're gonna both use Google Earth, which we already calculated based off of those measurements. And then we're also gonna use Strava. We're just gonna do a run and we're gonna start the, the run right at the base of the rope. And then as soon as I get off, I'm gonna hit the end button, which should give us an approximation of the distance. Of course, these numbers aren't gonna be super clean, but it, going between those two, we should be able to get an, an average that should be pretty close to the actual rope length. distance it was getting a tenth of a mile and we calculated that to feet and that came out to be 528 feet google earth i was getting about 560 but i was including all the way um to the pulleys so this we're not going to count that because obviously it's not usable rope for that case you're just going to the hula hoop or the emergency stop so if you take that out or both of them are going to be right on track for that 530. All right, so just to cross check our numbers that we got some, from some of our apps here, we did rerun this on Google Earth with the more up-to-date point. We're getting the length of uh, 535, and if we change this over to miles, it's that tenth of a mile that we got off the app. So they're checking out really well, so I think all of our numbers make sense. So now it's time to crunch those numbers and figure out how many people we can hypothetically get up the hill using that rope toe. The Highland Hills rope is about 530 feet long. The small park rope travels at about 11 miles an hour, while the big park is a little bit faster, moving at 14 miles an hour. If we account for seven feet of spacing in between each skier and rider in ideal conditions, we would be able to load about 75 people on the rope at any given time. To calculate the uphill capacity for the small park rope, we will take that 11 miles per hour and convert it to about 16 feet per second. With seven feet of spacing, that means that we will be offloading about two and a third skiers every second. If we multiply that by 60, that'll give us 140 skiers or riders offloading per minute. And if we multiply that number by 60 minutes, we'll get our ideal uphill capacity of 8,400 skiers and riders per hour. Using that same calculation on the 14 mile an hour rope in the big park gives us a total uphill capacity of about 10,800 skiers and riders moving uphill every single hour. This machine over here, 10,000 on the big park uphill capacity, over 10,000. And even on the small park, over 8,000 compared to this machine right here, <laughs> this quad that only moves 2,400 per hour. That's over four times if you count them individually or eight times if you count them as a total, both ropes. That's absolutely insane. So you can start to think about how much more uphill capacity you get by installing a rota. The other fun thing is that that lift costs anywhere from two to 10% of what that lift costs. That lift can range anywhere between 1.4 to probably $1.6 million. And I talked with the crew here and we estimate that this lift in today's dollars probably cost them about $150,000 to make, which is absolutely insane to think that that machine can move so many more people, but yet it costs so much less than that machine. Another couple things that I love about rope toes, number one, it only requires one operator to run both. So you're technically running two lifts with just one operator because as long as they have line of sight from the top, you only need one person in the box up there to stop the ropes if they need it. Another great thing is obviously there's nothing that could go absolutely wrong with this, right? Let's say even the motor gives out, your shiv wheels fall off, whatever it may be, you don't have passengers hanging in the air so all they have to do, if, if anything ever stops, there's no evacuation needed, they just have to let go of the rope and slide down the hill. The ski industry in the Midwest and in the world really started with surface lifts, especially in the Midwest with rope toes. I believe they're an absolute staple to the Midwest and I am surprised that more ski areas don't install them, especially on their parks or areas that people are regularly lapping. I think the numbers speak for themselves of how much value they offer. Now there are some downsides, of course. You know, it does get tiring to have to hold on to that rope, but they do make devices for that. Something called a nutcracker, which we'll save for a different video. But I hope this video kind of demonstrated why I think rope toes are so valuable, especially in a setting like this, where kids just want to get out and have fun. But until next time, I hope everybody has a great week. Pray for that snow, and I'll see you out there.